All right, we are going to read chapter four of Sparrowhawk Red. So if you remember, at the end of chapter three, he had just gotten the crazy idea that maybe he could be the one to steal the plane. So we're going to keep reading. Um, Ricky could not think of a way to steal the Skyhawk. He puzzled till his head hurt, then crossed to the dresser and did what he had done many times over the last three years. He pulled a photo album from the bottom drawer and returned to sit on the edge of his bed. Trembling, he turned the pages. One picture showed mom, dad, and him in swimming suits by the ocean. Dad had dark brown skin and hair that looked funny in a swimming suit, like a bulldozer. Mom had soft, lighter skin and blonde hair. Ricky didn't like looking at the picture of himself. His ribby chest, bony shoulders, and big cheekbones made him look like a skeleton. Several pages later, Ricky stopped and stared at another picture. This one was taken at the county fair. He had just won $25 in a pig wrestling contest. He would never have won by wrestling like most of the other kids, grabbing the biggest greased oinker and trying to muscle it across the line. He had been too small. He won by using his head. He ran to the smallest pig, a 50-pounder, and grabbed a hoof. He figured out that the hooves weren't greased. Gripping hard, he was able to drag the jerking and squealing pig across the line. In the picture, Mom stood beside him wearing her favorite yellow dress, making him look even more dirty. His grubby body was almost unrecognizable, but Mom was hugging him. Her thin arm wrapped tightly around his shoulders. He hadn't cared about the mud or whether she wore a good dress. They shouldn't have killed you, Mama, Ricky cried softly, gripping the photo album with white knuckles. His mom stared back up from the page, smiling. How could anyone have killed someone so kind and gentle, so pretty? Dad shouldn't have refused to go after the plane, Ricky thought. Benito could cross the border and not stand out like a gringo. The longer Ricky studied the picture, the deeper an idea snagged in his mind. He looked much like the street children he'd seen in Mexico. Why couldn't he go down and pretend to be a ratero, a street rat, as they called them? Sure, it sounded crazy, but that was exactly why it might work. A young ratero could get close to the Camacho cattle ranch. Who, wouldn't, who would be expecting a homeless boy to steal an airplane? After chewing on the thought a while, Ricky swallowed it. Mama, he said aloud, I'll go and act like I'm a ratero. I won't let them get away with what they did to you. He sniffled back tears and imagined her speaking. Oh, bunk, she said. This was how mom spoke. Don't you call those kids rateros. They're not street rats. They're just like you, only they've had bad luck. Now you get your schoolwork done and quit worrying about me. For the first time, rebellion crept into Ricky's mind. Mom never wanted anyone to fuss or bother over her. Well, that was just tough. He had a plan and nobody could stop him. It all seemed simple. Dress up as a rotero, and they were street rats, he thought to himself. Then sneak up to the Skyhawk and fly it home. There were things he would have to figure out, like how to get there. Would there be guards? What if someone caught him? The more he puzzled over the plan, the less simple it all seemed. Ricky stayed alone in his room thinking. Once during the evening, Benito knocked on the door. Ricky, he said gently. When there was no answer, he called again. Ricky... Go away, Ricky yelled. Go away and leave me alone. After a long pause, footsteps faded down the hallway. Ricky didn't blame Dad for his mom's death, but why didn't Dad do something? Why didn't he go after the airplane? No matter what got said, Ricky or Dad was being a quitter, a low-down quitter. And this was the worst kind of quitting, Ricky thought. Dad had a choice. It wasn't like getting beaten up at school. Ricky remembered one particularly bad whooping he got from some bullies. Two big ninth graders had cornered him. While several kids stood and watched, the two bullies pounded him until his face was puffy and his lips swollen. When Ricky could no longer fight back, the big boys stood over him. You quitter, they yelled again and again. Get up and fight. One grabbed him by his long hair and dragged him in circles on his knees. A hard yank sent him sprawling. The bully held up a strand of Ricky's ink black hair and laughed. Oof. Ricky had wanted so badly to move or to prove he wasn't a quitter. When he tried to get up, they knocked him down again, still laughing. If only they knew he was a pilot, they wouldn't laugh, Ricky thought. He didn't dare tell them, though, nor did he dare tattle to Dad. That would only make it worse. Then he would be a squealer. Nothing he did that day could prove he wasn't a quitter. But today was different. Today he could do something. Before going to bed, Ricky pulled his small gym bag from the closet. 
In it, he stuffed a tattered old pair of blue jeans and a dirty ripped t-shirt. Most Mexicans lived and dressed very well, but not the Roteros. They slept on the sidewalks and went barefoot, wearing rags for clothes. Ricky's feet weren't tough enough to go barefoot. Even his oldest pair of tennis shoes weren't real old, but he threw them in. Two more things might help. First, his photo ID, just in case he couldn't steal the plane. Mexican customs seldom checked anyone coming into their country. Coming back across, however, U.S. immigration would ask to see identification. Second, his jackknife. A knife would help him cut and strip wires to get the plane started. That was something he'd learned helping Dad install an ignition switch on the baby Great Lakes. He hoped a Skyhawk would be the same. He put the knife and ID card into his bag. Not able to think of anything else, he crawled into bed. He lay awake thinking. What difference did it make if Mom died accidentally or was killed? Either way, she was dead. Nothing would bring her back. Ricky's anger refused that notion. Stealing the plane was something he needed to do. He'd do it for Mom, and because he wasn't a quitter. Thoughts of a crashing car, of airplanes, and of grubby Roteros tumbled in his head. Even after the moon disappeared above the window, he could not sleep. The lighted clock radio on the dresser displayed each minute forever. Ricky watched the hours pass. When dawn finally glowed into the room, he dozed off. He dreamed he was at Kitty Hawk, sitting in the Wright Brothers' kite-like biplane, getting ready to prove to the world that he could fly. With men running along, holding the wingtips, he stared, started his roll down the rail. Faster and faster and faster, he tried to be gentle on the controls as he rose into the sky. He floated up and kept floating like a bird. He was free. Then he dreamed he was Chuck Yeager, sitting in the Bell X-1, getting ready to try and break the sound barrier. Nobody had ever gone the speed of sound. Some said it would kill you. Your body would blow up and pop like a balloon. Others said the pressure would crush you. Nobody knew for sure. Everybody waited and watched. A large transport plane released the Bell X-1 rocket plane from the bay, and Ricky reached forward and ignited the rockets. It felt like a mule kicked him in the back. Faster and faster he flew, 500, 550, 600, 650, some ominous shaking, the rocket roared loudly, severe vibration, 680, the instruments blurred, still faster, 690, a sharp bump, and then only smooth and eerie silence. Up and at him, lazy bones, time for school, Benito called. I'm headed to town, I'll give you a ride. Ricky jarred awake and rolled from the bed. Okay, he groaned, yawning hard. His skull felt numb and he rubbed his sore eyes. It was hard to organize his jumbled thoughts. This morning, everything had to seem normal. Stretching, he squirmed into his school clothes and combed his long hair back off his shoulders. Dishes clinked in the kitchen. Ricky tiptoed to the hall closet. He and Dad kept a shoebox with Mexican pesos. Whenever they visited Mexico, they used the money from this stash instead of going through an exchange at the border. Ricky pulled down the box. There appealed to be quite a bit of money, but he reminded himself that 3,000 pesos equaled roughly $1. The handful of bills he had scooped up probably didn't amount to about $20. Carrying around at Mexican money was fun. Big wads of money made Ricky feel rich, at least until he had to buy something. It always seemed like a jip when a bottle of pop cost a thousand pesos. Ricky stuffed the bills into his pocket and walked into the kitchen to join his dad. For a moment, neither spoke. Benito broke the ice. How are you feeling this morning? Pretty good, Ricky answered casually. Throughout breakfast, though, he avoided further talk. He was too tired to think clearly, and he didn't want to say anything that might make dad suspicious. After eating, Benito picked up Ricky's gym bag. We better get hopping. School starts in about 20 minutes. Do you have everything you need here? Ricky held his breath and nodded. Together they walked out the door and across the yard. The gym bag swung loosely in Benito's hand. Ricky eyed it and fought the urge to grab it. If it felt too heavy or if the jackknife rattled, Dad might look inside. When Benito crawled into the old Ford pickup, he tossed the bag onto the seat between them. Ricky pulled the bag close and guarded it with his arm, letting out a relieved breath. As the pickup bounced along the three-mile rutted road to town, Benito glanced over. Do you want to go flying after school? No. Ricky kept gazing out at the desert. The mesquite cactus and desert willow stretched for miles. He smiled to himself. He'd go flying, sure enough, but without Dad and without the baby Great Lakes. The day's pale blue sky and low winds made it perfect for flying. Benito hit the brakes and Ricky looked forward. A roadrunner had dashed across the road and down into the ditch. 
had ducked, scurried off among the brittle brush. After all the years watching cartoons, Ricky half expected Roadrunners to go beep beep. They actually did make a kind of honking sound, but more like a brack brack. Nearing town, Benito interrupted the thick silence. It hurts, doesn't it? Ricky didn't answer. Their mother's dying is a deep wound. Let it heal, Benito said. Getting angry won't make the pain go away. Ricky didn't like the comparison. This was a lot worse than a wound, but using the same reasoning, he shot back, yeah, and if you don't take care of it, it gets infected and never heals. Benito bit at his bottom lip and thought. You're still thinking about the DAA agents in that airplane, aren't you, he said. Ricky turned his head away, afraid anything he might say would give away his plan. Ricky, I'm not being a quitter. If I went after that airplane, it wouldn't solve or heal anything. Can't you see that? You have to let your mother go. They drove on in silence. When the pickup pulled to a stop in front of the school, Ricky slid out. Do you want me to pick you up? Benito asked, or do you want to take the school bus home? I'll get home on my own, Ricky slammed the door closed. Dad would have tadpoles if he knew what that meant. Okay, have a good day. I'll see you this afternoon. Oh, don't forget this, Mijito. Benito handed the gym bag out the window. Ricky swallowed deep to keep from choking. He'd nearly forgotten the bag. What a slick move. How would he ever sneak a high-tech radar and airplane out of a drug compound if he couldn't remember a bag of old clothes? He had to wake up, start thinking. Ricky grabbed the bag. Benito smiled warmly. Ricky met his smile with an accusing stare. Dad, I don't like being called Mejito. It makes me sound like a little kid. A pained look flicked in Benito's eyes. Ignoring it, Ricky turned away and walked towards school. When the pickup rounded the corner out of sight, Ricky broke into a run toward the bus stop two blocks away. He arrived, panting heavily. A group of people stood waiting, looking bored. Still breathing hard, Ricky fidgeted with the handle of his gym bag. If people only knew what he had planned. Soon a bus pulled to the curb, brakes screeching. Passengers pushed and shoved as they climbed aboard. Each had to drop change into the slot before crowding to the back. As Ricky worked his way down the aisle, he tried to think clearly. Skipping school seemed wrong, and so did stealing an airplane. It was tempting to turn back, but there was still time. No one would know. The memory of the pig wrestling picture popped into his head. Mom would know if he quit. She would always know. He had to give it an honest try. This was the only way he could think of to make things right. The bus rattled across town. At the south end of the route, Ricky filed off behind other passengers. The border crossing waited only a few hundred feet away. A line of people jostled to pass through the checkpoint. Among the mostly Mexican crowd, a few Americans stood out, their clothes bright as Christmas tree ornaments. Ricky felt like one of the tourists with his long hair and good clothes. One thing made him different. He looked at his brown hands. His dark skin was the key to his plan. The customs agent barely glanced up as Ricky moved through the turnstile. A sign on the wall read, Welcome to Mexico. So what do you guys think about Ricky's plan? Do you think it's good or too dangerous? We will read chapter five next.